Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm an assistant professor of clinical sciences at Keck Graduate Institute, and today we will be discussing nutrition and surgery in gastrointestinal disease. The reason why we're talking about this topic today is that surgery and gastrointestinal disease represent many different subsets of patients who may require nutrition support therapy. And as a pharmacist, it's important to basically um, distinguish between different subsets of this rather large population of patients in terms of macronutrient and micronutrient requirements as um, indicated um, so that you can provide a um, adequate nutrition support regimen for your patient who has either surgery gastro or um, some type of gastrointestinal disease. Um, so our objectives today will be to identify etiologies of pancreatitis and short bowel syndrome, and then to discuss nutritional considerations of specific GI um, diseases, including pancreatitis and short bowel syndrome, as well as patients who have received surgery. So the first group of disorders that we'll actually discuss are um, those that are gastrointestinal diseases. And gastrointestinal diseases encompass a wide variety of subsets of actual disease. These can include motility disorders such as gastroparesis that um, some can sometimes be seen in diabetic patients. These can be um, patients who have celiac disease um, or essentially allergies um, and intolerances to gluten. Um, this might include patients that have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, those who have inflammatory bowel disease, who you have actually talked about previously. Um, those who um, have cystic fibrosis, which you've also talked about previously um, in the pulmonology um, course, um, therapeutics course. Those who have liver disease, which we've talked about in the previous lecture, as well as pancreatitis and short bowel syndrome. So as you see that there, there are a wide variety of gastrointestinal diseases that we can discuss um, the ones that we're going to focus on for today's purposes are pancreatitis and short bowel syndrome in regards to gastrointestinal or GI diseases. So we're going to talk about pancreatitis first. In the United States, acute pancreatitis incidence is about 40 per 100,000 adult years. So while that doesn't really seem like a big number, um, in regards to actual adult years, um, its impact on the economy and on its patients is very significant. And we essentially see about cost in excess of $2.5 billion, which is pretty hefty cost in regards to a disease state. In regards to pancreatitis, it's important to understand what actually happens in pancreatitis before we actually discuss a little bit more about how to actually treat pancreatitis and how to give nutrition support adequately to these patients. So in pancreatitis, there's some kind of acute injury that happens or initial insult, and that essentially um, activates zymogens um, and may result in ischemia and duct obstruction, um, depending on the etiology of the actual um, pancreatitis. Um, because of that, you get a release of active enzymes and other vasoactive substances and a large inflammatory response that basically leads to ischemia and inflammation. And basically, more or less what happens is, um, particularly in cases where you have large amounts of zymogen activation, and remember zymogens are essentially precursors to enzymes, you get basically lots of enzyme um, degradation of your pancreas. So basically, it's more or less the way I think of it, your pancreas eating itself. And that obviously results in tissue damage to the pancreas and cell death of the pancreas. So this is what happens whenever you have a patient who has acute pancreatitis. You have some kind of insult that happens that eventually leads to the death of the pancreas or death of cells in the pancreas. Um, the most common etiologies um, for the initial insult of pancreatitis, at least on the acute side, are alcohol abuse and gallstones. Those are the two main etiologies for pancreatitis. 
um, and other idiopathic causes along with alcohol abuse and gallstones account for about 90% of acute pancreatitis cases. Some other main causes that are important to note are hypertriglyceridemia, particularly when your triglycerides are above 1,000. Um, pan pancreatitis is linked to um, hypertriglyceridemia. Um, so if your patient actually has an elevated triglyceride level above 400, you should not give patients fat or fat emulsion. You should withhold giving fat or fat emulsion until your triglycerides are less than 400. And that number of 400 is essentially more or less a safety measure um, so that it eventually doesn't spike up to 1,000. Um, but clinically, in most cases, you won't see um, pancreatitis happen until triglycerides get above 1,000. You also may see pancreatitis result as a result of medications, and as a pharmacist, that's a very important point to bring up. Some medications that can actually cause pancreatitis um, include propofol, which can obviously lead to hypertriglyceridemia because it is contained in fat emulsion, um, as well as clovidipine, which is an agent that we typically um, may use for hypertensive emergencies, so an IV medication that's also contained in fat emulsion. Other medications that actually may result in pancreatitis are medications as common as GLP-1 agonists um, that are used to treat diabetes. Um, so some examples of those medications are exenatide and liraglutide. Um, for purposes of other etiologies of pancreatitis, we might also see pancreatitis happen as a result of autoimmune and tropical diseases, infection, hereditary factors, as well as cancer or malignancy. Some signs and symptoms of pancreatitis include severe epigastric pain. Typically, this pain is going to be pain that basically feels like more or less, as some patients describe it, a knife to the back, more or less, where basically it kind of goes through your back and radiates into your left abdomen and mid-back. You may also get nausea and vomiting um, as a result of pancreatitis. Um, remember, your pancreas is in your abdominal area, and whenever you have inflammation of anything in your abdominal area, that will cause more or less distension of um, your abdomen and may cause nausea and vomiting symptoms because you may feel nauseous and you may vomit um, as a result you may develop anorexia where you don't want to take in dietary intake, and that's obviously a problem. Um, some labs that are associated with pancreatitis include amylase and lipase levels. Um, amylase levels may be elevated init initially um, upon acute insult. However, the lipase level is the one that will actually be um, elevated um, over a longer period of time, and that typically elevates after amylase levels begin to ele elevate. In patients that have pancreatitis, you may also see SERS criteria. So remember, SERS criteria are essentially an elevated heart rate above um, 90 or 100, depending on what your definition is um, related to that SERS criteria. Um, an elevated temperature or a low temperature an elevated respiratory rate, as well as an elevated white blood cell count, typically above 12,000 or a low white blood cell count below 4,000 where a patient might be neutropenic. So you may see SERS criteria related to pancreatitis. Remember, SERS criteria are nonspecific inflammatory criteria. And while we still think about SERS criteria as being significant for infection, SERS criteria may also be a sign that a patient potentially has pancreatitis. So um, in, in regards to SERS criteria, you always want to make sure of what the source of that SERS criteria is before you actually begin treatment of a patient. Um, and in some cases, that might actually be infection or even sepsis, um, which is basically infection related to um, related organ failure. Or it may be other causes such as pancreatitis or a post-surgical response or a stress response. So SERS criteria, remember, are nonspecific. In regards to diagnosis of pancreatitis, there's many different ways that you can assess pancreatitis and pancreatitis severity. You can use a CT scan to check for necrosis of the pancreas. 
Um, some common scores that are used are the Ransom score, the Emory score, and the Apache 2 score. Um, the most common that are used in practice that I have seen personally are the Ransom score and the Apache 2 score. These are basically just scores that um, are related to disease severity. Um, with Apache 2 score, Apache 2 score is actually um, a more broad score that's actually related to overall disease severity and actually can be used to predict um, mortality rate. The higher the Apache 2 score, the worse off a patient is. The higher a ransom score, the additional worse off a patient is as well. Um, C-reactive protein can obviously be used to check for inflammation, and you also have your SERS criteria as we mentioned on the slide previously. So in regards to differentiating different degrees of pancreatitis, this slide is very important to know, um, particularly in differentiating mild and moderate pancreatitis um, to patients who have severe pancreatitis. What I want to draw your attention to on this slide is the Apache 2 score differences in the ransom criteria or ransom score differences. For a patient who have severe pancreatitis, we typically associate that with an Apache 2 score of 10, um, of at least 10, or a ransom score of at least 3. If your ransom score is 2 or less, or, or if your Apache 2 score is 9 or less, that's typically associated with mild or moderate pancreatitis. Um, and you see here that on this slide, you actually have a correlation with mild and moderate pancreatitis to the chances that you're actually going to be able to take PO intake in seven days. So remember with pancreatitis, you have severe nausea, vomiting, that can lead to essentially anorexia. And because of that, patients may not actually um, be able to take in a PO diet. Um, in addition, PO diet may also um, additionally stimulate over secretion of um, pancreatic enzymes that may further um, increase um, pancreatitis severity as well. Though we still want to try to feed patients orally if possible, if they are able to tolerate it. Um, because remember, a PO or enteral diet will basically promote gut immunity and the immunity of your patient overall, um, as well as the health of your GI tract. So if you have, your patient has mild or moderate pancreatitis, the chances that you're going to be um, transitioning to a PO diet are about 81% in seven days. If you have severe pancreatitis, as defined by an Apache 2 of at least 10 or a Ransom score of at least 3, you actually have a chance of um, zero of being on a PO diet in seven days. Um, so obviously there's a very drastic difference here in terms of the scoring. In regards to mild and moderate pancreatitis, typically our management of this is supportive in nature. So if we can give them oral diet, we can, we can give them oral diet, or in some cases they may require enteral nutrition via tube feeding. For patients with severe pancreatitis, a lot of times they're not going to be able to tolerate oral feeding, um, obviously because this percentage here is zero. And because of that, you may need to actually do enteral nutrition with the patient. Um, or parental nutrition. These patients a lot of times will actually require um, admission also to an intensive care unit. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. Um, in regards to acute pancreatitis nutrition, the first thing that you always want to do for any patient is to ensure hemodynamic stability. So make sure that the patient has non oppressors and their MAP or mean arterial pressure is adequate, so at least 65 millimeters of mercury, prior to starting any kind of enteral nutrition. Because remember, if your um, patient is not hemodynamically stable and that blood is shunting away from the gut, the patient is more likely to have nausea and vomiting if you introduce any type of nutrition or anything into the bowel. So in those patients, you want to make sure you're hemodynamically stable first before you give them a standard poly um, um, polymeric enteral nutrition formula, if the patient can tolerate it. Um, if you have a patient that develops diarrhea, and this not only goes for acute pancreatitis, but for all patients, if you have patients who develop diarrhea um, that um, you don't know necessarily the origin of, you may not necessarily know that it's because of the tube feeding, 
Um, you should not stop feeds because of that. If your patient has diarrhea, you should check for C. diff. Um, C. diff is a relatively um, common bug that we find, particularly in healthcare settings, and the diarrhea actually might be related to C. diff. Though the diarrhea in many cases might actually be due to the enteral nutrition formula itself. So if you have signs of intolerance, such as diarrhea, um, increased pain or fever, or white blood cell count, amylase or lipase, you might have a patient who may need a more broken down formula or an elemental or semi-elemental formula um, that is low fat in nature and that potentially has medium chain triglycerides. So some examples of these semi-elemental and elemental formulas include Vital, um, as we talked about in the Entero Nutrition um, talk, as well as Vivanex. Um, those are basically formulas that are semi-elemental and elemental in nature. They are essentially more broken down and they are not necessarily um, polymeric in nature. They are, are, they are very broken down in terms of the macronutrient content. Um, for pancreatitis, you obviously want to keep the head of a patient's bed elevated. Um, we do this typically at 30 degrees to prevent any kind of aspiration from occurring. So remember, patients with pancreatitis will have potentially lots of nausea and vomiting happen. If a patient vomits, that increases obviously their risk of aspiration if they are especially lying down. If they vomit and they're lying down, they have a big risk of basically taking those vomited contents and basically shunting them to the lungs um, and swallowing it back into the lungs. And as a result of that, that may cause aspiration um, that may eventually develop into aspiration pneumonia um, and need to be treated with um, antimicrobials. Um, for calorie goal for pancreatitis, we typically say 25 kilocalories per kilo per day is a safe calorie goal. If you're in the ICU, obviously you can use a range of 25 to 30. That would perfectly be fine because it encompasses that 25 component. Um, for patients who have acute pancreatitis, these patients actually may um, need um, at least 1.5 grams per kilo of protein per day if their BMI is less than 30. Um, and particularly if you have acute pancreatitis and you come into the ICU, remember your ICU range is typically 1.2 to 2. In this case, for acute pancreatitis, you might actually make that range 1.5 to 2. In regards to feeding patients that have um, pancreatitis, we obviously want to evaluate the, se severe di um, the disease severity first by looking at SERS criteria, our prognostic scores such as our Ransom or Apache 2 scores, and then um, the CT scan to check for necrosis. If after se um, severity checks, particularly with that prognostic score of the Ransom or Apache 2, if you determine they have mild disease, you can uh, um, admit them to the regular floor or ward and advance them to oral diet as soon as the patient is able to advance to oral diet. You also may need to advance this patient um, potentially um, to enteral nutrition, but essentially you want to basically make sure that you're using that GI tract. So you should always try oral diet first if they have mild disease. If they're not able to tolerate oral, you may then advance later to enteral nutrition. If they have moderate or severe disease, um, and severe disease, remember, is a ransom of at least three or an Apache 2 score of at least 10. You want to admit them to the ICU, the intensive care unit. You want to place an NG tube down and start a standard enteral nutrition using a polymeric formula. If they tolerate that NG tube feeding um, with enteral nutrition, fantastic. Um, you basically just need to eventually transition them from enteral nutrition to a regular oral diet. Um, now, there are many cases where a patient with severe disease is not going to tolerate regular nasogastric tube feedings. And in those cases where they don't tolerate NG tube feedings, you can actually basically descend that tube further down into the GI tract into the jejunum and feed them via nasal jejunal feeds. Now, whenever you feed nasal jejunally, one thing that you want to keep in the back of your mind is that you want to feed patients in the jejunum continuously. So as opposed to the stomach where we can feed the stomach um, intermittently um, in boluses or even continuously, with the jejunum we always want to feed continuously because 
remember that if you feed in the jejunum, you're essentially passing the stomach and the duodenum parts of your digestion. Um, or basically the roles that your stomach and duodenum play in your digestion. And as a result of that, if you feed patients intermittently who um, are receiving feeds in the jejunum um, terminally, then in that case, um, you may develop what is called dumping syndrome, where essentially the patient will dump out a lot of the contents um, that they're actually being infused with nutrition-wise. And because of that, um, you want to feed these patients over a longer period of time with lower rates and continuously. So basically, you won't necessarily give them a low rate per se. You'll still advance them to a normal standard rate, but you will um, not do it over short periods of time. You'll do it continuously over a 24-hour period. If your patient still doesn't tolerate um, feeding even after doing nasal jejunal route, you can start parental nutrition if your patient has been intolerant for five days. Um, this is just a recommendation per this schematic that you see here. If your patient obviously has poor tolerability um, and say, for example, their acute process has basically resolved, so basically they're getting better, but they're still not tolerant feeding and they have um, a high um, risk of being malnourished or already malnourished um, per your assessment of your patient, you can actually start peeing even earlier than this five days if you need to. This is just a guide. Um, but for exam purposes, we're going to follow this relative schematic here. But in practice, you may see them start parental nutrition earlier depending on the patient's tolerability. This is just a recommendation here. Um, so now that we've finished pancreatitis, we're going to move on to short bowel syndrome. In regards to short bowel syndrome, it's epidemiology. Um, about 10 to 20 percent of home care patients actually have short bowel syndrome. Um, and the prevalence may be higher um, if including those patients who are not on PN. Um, so as you see here, short bowel syndrome represents a large population of nutrition support patients. Between 2000 and 2013 in the United States, about 78% of intestinal transplants were completed as a result of short bowel syndrome, or SBS. And look at how much bowel you actually have here. About three quarters of your bowel can be anywhere between 300 centimeters to 600 centimeters of bowel. So it's a relatively large part. Um, but it also is potentially dependent on what parts of the bowel actually get resected because as we'll see shortly we'll see that you can actually resect different parts of bowel um, depending on your different your different clinical situations that happen so in terms of what causes patients to um, need or have need for a small bowel resection in children that may actually be a result of congenital malformations um, or severe infections at birth. Say, for example, they get a severe intra-abdominal infection um, during their birth. Um, and as a result of that intra-abdominal infection, um, they may develop sepsis, for example. Um, that sepsis can lead to septic shock, and you get potentially poor perfusion to that bowel, and you get essentially what is known as ischemic bowel, or essentially a bowel that is dying because it has not had enough oxygen because of low blood flow, um, because of basically hypotension. In those cases where you have dead, in, dead bowel, that dead bowel essentially is infected bowel, and your body is basically trying to fight against that bowel, but essentially the only... Um, treatment that will be effective is to remove part of that bowel um, because of that infection just basically killing off that bowel more or less. So in those cases, those patients may need small bowel resections even at young ages. In adult patients, depending on severity of Crohn's disease, for example, patients may get part of their bowel resected. Um, if they have mesenteric valvular Vas sorry, mesenteric vascular insufficiency, which just basically means essentially a um, similar concept to ischemic bowel. 
if they don't have a lot of blood flow to their mesentery or to their abdominal area um, due to either hypotension or due to some other type of disorder, then in that case the bowel dies. And whatever part of the bowel that dies may have to be resected um, because it will obviously pose um, an infection risk or and may actually be causing active infection that can kill the patient. And that is a case where you may need to do a small bowel resection. If you have post-surgical complications um, where you develop potentially infection, for example, um, you may need to resect part of the bowel. If you have malignancy, um, particularly malignancies of the GI tract, um, some parts of the bowel can actually become um, malignant um, during certain stages of patients' lives. And in some cases, in addition to potential chemotherapy and or radiation, you may have to have that part of the bowel resected to um, limit the proliferation of that cancer. In addition, trauma is another big reason why patients might have um, a small bowel resection and then eventually um, short bowel syndrome. And essentially with trauma, if you think about it, basically, if you have a trauma to the gut, in that case, it might actually cause damage to that gut where the damage might be um, irreparable or not repairable. In those cases, you may have to resect the small bowel. In regards to short bowel syndrome, some common symptoms that you see um, from having part of your bowel taken out um, or having short bowel syndrome in general or diarrhea. Um, because essentially at that point, your um, nutrients may not be digested very well. You may see malnutrition with patients, um, obviously because their nutrients are not absorbed as well, depending on what part of the GI tract is gone, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, we're related to parts of the GI tract and how they play a role on absorption. You may see dehydration in these patients, particularly if you have... Um, no longer an ileum, for example, um, or no longer have parts of your colon. Because remember, your ileum is one of the big parts of your bowel that is responsible for um, water reabsorption. And you might see many other um, signs and symptoms related to um, patients who have short bowel syndrome, um, particularly um, vitamin and nutrient deficiencies are very common in these patients because if you resect certain parts of the bowel, you may see um, development of some of our um, common vitamin and nutrient and other nutrient deficiencies. Um, there are many different anatomical variants of short bowel syndrome. The three that I want you to know um, are essentially the jejunoiliocolonic anastomosis, um, the jejunoiliocolonic anastomosis, and the injejunostomy. Um, now, these terms are obviously very confusing, but we're going to break them down to make them a little bit easier. The word anastomosis just means a joining together of two or more pieces. So whenever you see these um, words or basically um, broken down words basically put together are roots, essentially what you want to be looking for is how these roots are joined together. So in the case of a jejunoiliocolonic anastomosis, that means that some part of the jejunum ileum or colon might have been resected. And basically, at that point, you have a joining together of your jejunum ileum and colon. So essentially, this is what we can kind of consider more or less a colon in continuity for our purposes. Um, basically, your colon, for the most part, is still there. Part of it may have been resected, but essentially you still have a duodenum, a jejunum, and an ileum, as well as a colon. Now, in patients who have basically part, um, this, these, this kind of joining together happen um, at the end of their surgery, a jejunal ileocolonic anastomosis. In those cases, patients need at least 30 centimeters of residual small bowel or small intestine to wean off of parental nutrition. A lot of times post-surgery, um, surgeons are going to want to um, 
not want to give any oral feeding to patients, and it's completely understandable given the fact of a very, very severe and heavy surgery being done, um, where essentially they want to make sure that the bowel has time to rest, and because you don't want any damage to occur to that surgical um, manipulation, um, particularly within the days and weeks after um, that heavy or pretty severe surgery. So in these cases where you have basically more or less each part of the bowel still intact in some way, form, or fashion, you still need at least 30 centimeters of residual small intestine to wean off a PN. Now, this differs a little bit from jejunocolonic anastomosis, um, which you see here in the middle section. Um, basically, what is done here is that this, these patients have essentially more or less their entire ileum taken out. Um, and they may, may also have part of their jejunum or part of their colon taken out as well. But the main part here is that je the jejunum and the colon are anastomosed together or joined together, so there is no ileum left. And remember, the ileum is important for, obviously, water um, reabsorption. In these patients, you need at least 60 centimeters of residual small bowel to wean off of PN um, post-surgery. In patients um, in, the last anatomical in the last anatomical variation called NJ genostomy, what this basically means is that the bowel is in continuity up until the jejunum, and it basically ends the jejunum. And this may be because essentially the ileum and the colon may be completely resected, or essentially because they, it has not been rejoined yet. Um, in some cases, um, status post some of these GI surgeries, they may opt to do um, an end ostomy. Um, so that they can let parts of the bowel heal before rejoining the bowel together. For NJ genostomy, you need at least 100 centimeters of residual small bowel to wean off a of PN. Um, and these are patients, um, if they don't have that much left, um, these are patients who may require permanent parental nutrition. Um, and that um, is obviously, you know, can be devastating to a patient, especially if they're not able to tolerate oral food ever again. Um, but obviously, in these types of surgeries, the goal is to preserve as much of that residual small bowel as possible to prevent basically being on parental nutrition for long periods of time. One thing I want to bring up here um, on this slide is basically the fact that different parts of the GI tract will actually absorb different things. Um, so in relation to our GI tract, we obviously will start in the esophagus where the nutrients are taken in. That will then go into the stomach and then into the duodenum. The duodenum is a place where iron is absorbed. Then your nutrients go down into the jejunum that you see here, and that's where um, nutrients such as magnesium, calcium, fat-soluble vitamins, so your A, D, E, and K, and your water-soluble vitamins are actually reabsorbed. Um, a lot of your water-soluble vitamins, but not all of your water-soluble vitamins, as we'll see shortly. In regards to the ileum, that's actually where you see vitamin B12 absorbed. So in patients who have a jejunocolonic anastomosis, who don't have an ileum, they will actually need supplementation of vitamin B12 via the IV route for potentially the rest of their lives, especially if they don't have an ileum here. Um, remember that um, in regards to vitamin B12, vitamin B12 um, is actually secreted along with intrinsic factor in the stomach and it binds to intrinsic factor within the stomach. So if you have certain gastric resections where you don't um, produce as much intrinsic factor, they, that might also limit your vitamin B12 absorption because you need intrinsic factor for vitamin B12 to be absorbed in the ileum. You also see bioacids reabsorbed in the ileum as well as we discussed water and what goes with water, sodium, 
and what goes with sodium, water. In the colon, you also see a small amount of water reabsorbed, bile acids reabsorbed, and um, small amounts of sodium, potassium, and chloride. In the overall small intestine, you see zinc um, absorbed in the small intestine as well, and this is absorbed in the duodenum and the jejunum. And in terms of copper, you see a small amount of that in the stomach. I want you to basically commit this slide to memory as it's very important to be aware of what micronutrient and macronutrient deficiencies and what other types of deficiencies can occur if you resect parts of your gastrointestinal tract. It's very important to know. In regards to patients who have short bowel syndrome, they may actually need what are known as oral rehydration solutions to um, sustain their um, adequate fluid intake. And these basically differ um, into two different categories, colon incontinuity and in jejunostomy. So basically in jejunostomy is basically um, your small bowel intact up until the jejunum where essentially that um, in part of the jejunum is then joined up until the upper part of your abdomen into an ostomy or an opening. Colon incontinuity means that you essentially still have um, your colon intact or at least mostly intact. Um, and this is basically the case in patients who have jejunocolonic anastomosis and jejunoiliocolonic anastomosis. Um, so in these patients, um, what is important to know is that um, hyperosmolar solutions such as fruit juices, sugar containing soft drinks, and nutritional supplements are not very well tolerated in these patients. Um, remember that we want to obviously optimize um, fluid or water absorption. And by having a patient who is very hyper or is basically getting oral rehydration solutions that are very hyperosmolar, such as fruit juices and sugar-containing items, basically that will cause fluid to basically stay with those hyperosmolar items because basically osmolarity can also potentially dictate um, water retention as well. So basically what that means is that if you have a hyperosmolar fluid, it's going to draw water towards it. And if you have hyperosmolar fluids, um, those hyperosmolar fluids are basically going to keep the water um, within the gut. So you want to avoid these fluids mostly at all cost um, and any type of colon incontinuity or angiogenostomy. In regards to patients um, who... Um, can receive isoosmolar or isotonic fluids. In patients with colon incontinuity, patients with less than 50% of a colon may benefit from oral rehydration solutions. And these solutions are essentially either homemade, they can be milk, they can be diluted juices, they can be um, some enteral formulas, or even made as a commercial solution. These, these oral rehydration solutions are essentially um, more or less water um, enhanced with electrolytes and other nutrients. In the case of NJ genostomy, oral rehydration solutions are the main source of hydration, and remember that is because these patients lack an ileum. Um, so you're going to want to try to maximize absorption of these solutions at all cost. Um, and remember, some water is still absorbed and minimal amounts in your patients who still have parts of their GI tract because remember you need essentially water to dissolute a lot of this stuff and you still have water channels throughout your GI tract. Um, but you essentially will need oral rehydration solutions, especially in patients with angiogenostomy. In patients who are taking in hyperosmolar fluids and colon incontinuity, these are usually tolerated okay. Those are things such as water, for example, that's hypoosmolar or hypotonic. Sugar-free soft drinks and powdered drink mixes are fine, and decaffeinated tea and coffee. For NJ genostomy, we usually restrict these to about four to six ounces per day. 
Um, and that's because of the hypotonic nature of these fluids. Um, so basically, you don't necessarily need to, you know, dehydrate your patient um, by basically getting a lack of water. They still need a little bit of water, but a lot of that water will actually come from their oral rehydration solutions that you see here. In regards to diet recommendations and short bowel syndrome, um, these are actually very complicated. Um, the main parts that I want you to know for the purposes of exam purposes are basically with emphasis on energy and protein. So um, patients who have colon incontinuity or angiogenostomy will actually require very high amounts of um, kilocals and high amounts of protein. This can be anywhere from 35 to 45 kilocals per kilo per day and up to 60 kilocals per kilo per day. And essentially, it's very, very high. Um, in terms of protein, um, they will need 1.5 to 2 grams per kilo per day. Remember that not a lot, of, not all of this um, food is actually absorbed um, if they are getting oral diet. And that's something that you have to take into account with these patients. That might be part of the reason why they actually have a higher calorie requirement in some cases. In some cases, it might just be inflammatory in nature. Um, they may need to eat smaller meals. Um, they may need to eat smaller meals of five to six meals evenly spaced throughout the day so that they're able to tolerate um, normal intake. Um, in terms of patients who um, have colon incontinuity versus angiogenostomy, these are just numbers um, to keep in the back of your mind. You don't necessarily need to commit these to memory. Patients in, with colon incontinuity will basically have a higher carbohydrate energy goal of 50 to 60 percent of their calories. And for angiogenostomy, it's much lower. It's 20 to 40. For fat, that actually makes up a higher energy intake for angiogenostomy patients um, versus colon incontinuity who only require about 20 to 30 percent. And you see the additional requirements here um, as um, reproduced from the third edition of the Aspen Core curriculum for adults. Um, again, the emphasis here I want to place for you to know is basically energy and protein requirements. The last topic we'll talk about is surgery. So in terms of epidemiology of surgery, injury is one of the most common causes of death in patients ages 1 to 44. And in terms of injury just in general, about 200 deaths occur annually. Some nutrition principles that we take into account whenever a patient has surgery is that a lot of times patients will be in negative nitrogen balance. And if you remember, nitrogen balance um, is essentially correlated to our energy intake and our protein intake. So if you are in negative nitrogen balance, that means that you are losing protein um, in some form or fashion. And this can result in weight loss, weakness, and um, obviously a longer rehabilitation time prior to returning back to your baseline function. Um, and this is essentially due, you know, for a variety of different reasons. Um, large parts of um, the reasons may be due to inflammatory response post-surgery. Um, it may also be due to what the surgery actually entailed and how much stress the patient was actually put under. Um, early administration of nutrition within 24 to 48 hours if you're giving enteral nutrition and nutritional supplementation is needed to reduce um, risk of surgical infection because obviously, remember, um, the more protein you give, the better you boost your immunity and the better you can actually heal post-surgery. Um, it may be correlated to hospital length of stay. Better nutrition is correlated to better outcomes and essentially time to return a baseline. Better nutritional status is correlated to um, better health in general. In regards to the different mechanisms that actually occur during stress and during surgery, I just want you to kind of get an idea of this. This is not a slide you need to memorize, but essentially a, a stress response 
um, from inflammatory markers such as TNF alpha, IL1, IL2, IL6, and interleukin 8 can actually stimulate the adrenal medulla and the central nervous system to produce different substances like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. That can actually lead to protein breakdown and fat breakdown that we see here. Skeletal muscle um, then basically leads more or less to insulin resistance that we see here and glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. So basically a production of glucose that we see. And this is all just related to stress response. And this stress response can be due to anything. The stress response, as we said before, um, stress response is basically a correlation of SERS criteria. This can be related to infection, it can be related to pancreatitis, and it can especially be related to surgery. Because whenever you um, have a surgical patient, anytime that you incise into a patient and you cut into a patient, a lot of inflammatory mediators are going to be starting to be produced and act activated. And because of all of those inflammatory mediators, you essentially get the net effect of hyperglycemia as well as other things that occur. So obviously patients who are post-surgery may have risk of post-op hyperglycemia and post-op SERS um, criteria. It doesn't necessarily mean the patient is diabetic in nature if they have hyperglycemia post-surgery. It just means that they're a normal human being who has basically been under a lot of stress and became hyperglycemic as a result of these pathways here. In regards to surgical ICU populations, we have a few different classifications. Um, we have the post-op major elective surgery patients. Um, we have major injuries such as burns and trauma. And we also have essentially what your core curriculum defines as serious sepsis, um, which for our purposes is just sepsis in general or infection. Um, that is essentially then propagated into organ failure. Um, the two main ones that we're going to focus on are um, major elective surgeries that are post-op um, and major injuries such as burns and trauma. In terms of major elective surgeries, patients are often depleted of body protein preoptively because of whatever disease process is going on with them. Um, so they may require surgery to essentially minimize or eliminate this disease process. And patients can lose 5% of total body protein within the first two weeks post-op, which in some in the average patient equivalents to about 43 grams per day. And whenever you think about 43 grams per day of protein, if you think about protein as four kilocals per kilo, this can be over 160 kilocals per day, which doesn't really seem like much over the course of one day, but those calories actually add up. And in the courses of weeks, can be very detrimental to a patient's nutritional status. So it's very important that you take early intervention in treating these um, elective surgery patients as soon as possible. Um, in regards to trauma and critical illness, in the first three weeks post-trauma or initial critical illness, about 20% of total body, total body protein is metabolized. And the severity of illness is compounded by many pre-existing conditions like liver disease, renal dysfunction, cardiac failure, basically organ failure in general, pulmonary failure requiring mechanical ventilation, obesity, and diabetes. Um, in regards to surgical nutrition requirements, caloric requirements should always be determined um, by indirect calorimetry um, as a gold standard, but as we know in practice that this is not um, always routinely feasible. Um, it can also be determined by predictive equations or weight-based equations. Um, weight-based equations obviously are used very commonly as they're very easy to use. For patients who have um, major surgeries, um, these patients may require at least 1.5 grams per kilo per day if their BMI is less than 30. And that can go all the way up to 2.5 grams per kilo per day if they get um, continuous renal replacement therapy. Um, the standard 
dosing range is 1.5 to 2 grams per kilo per day of protein. And that is whether or not they are in the intensive care unit or not. That also applies to basically patients who are on the floor or the ward. Um, in patients who um, are BMI 30 to 40, they get 2 grams per kilo per day of protein as their goal. For patients with BMI greater than 40, it's 2.5. And for patients who have large surface burns, where basically they are very, very, very catabolic in that sense and basically breaking down lots of nutrients and burning off lots of energy, they're going to need very high protein requirements, such as 3 to 4 grams per kilo per day of protein, to try to maintain sustenance. Um, and in some cases, you may not actually be able to maintain body weight even with this high amount of protein and calories that are given to patients. Um, as always, you always want to maintain a minimum of 150 grams per day of carbohydrate to maintain central nervous system function and cerebral function. Here are the references for today's talk. And if you have any questions regarding nutrition and surgery and gastrointestinal disease, please feel free to contact me. Thank you and have a great day.